All right, everybody, this is the video for chapter three. Let's get into it. All right, now, if you haven't already, do go and watch the TED Ed video about verb tenses that I posted on Canvas. Um, that does a really nice job of explaining all the different verb tenses. I'm gonna review that, but I really wanna focus on the passive voice so I'd rather you um, review that chapter material through that video, and then we'll talk more about the passive voice. Um, but just to kind of recap what happens in the chapter, uh, in English, we have the non-tense form of the verb, uh, what we call the base, um, sometimes the infinitive. And then we have four ways of tensing or inflecting our verbs with endings. And we do that to create present tense, past tense, the participle, excuse me, the past participle, and the present participle. Um, present usually takes an S at the end. The past tense and the past participle usually takes an ED, and the present participle usually takes an ING. And you'll notice I haven't mentioned future. I will get to that. But this is about how we inflect our verbs with endings to change the tense. Now, when a verb takes these usual inflections, we call it a regular verb, like learn to learns, learned, learn, or learning. But of course, when it doesn't, we call that an irregular verb. So there's buys and buys, but then it becomes bought and bought and then buying. So the past tense and the past participle are irregular. Now our most common verbs are the most irregular. For instance, to be changes a lot depending on whether we're talking about first person singular or plural, um, you know, I or we or um, ours and so forth. Um, I guess those are the pronouns, but um, anyways, um, <laughs> I don't wanna get sidetracked. Second person or third person singular or plural. Um, other types of verbs are a little bit more consistent, but something like go can become go, goes, went, went, and going, all of which are different variations. Only going is really regular. Now the, past and pa the present and past tense can stand on their own, but the past participles, uh, excuse me, the past participle and the present participle, those require some additional words to function. We call these auxiliaries. Now auxiliaries and also modals, both of which are sometimes called linking verbs, but that's not the same thing. So we should probably distinguish them. Um, these are words that function to change the tense or mode of a verb, okay? So as I said before, I haven't mentioned the future tense and that is because the future tense requires the auxiliary will or shall in order to become the future tense. Um, there's no ending that we add to our verbs in order to make them future tense. Likewise, um, the participle forms require either have or be to function. So uh, past participle requires the auxiliary verb have, and the present participle requires the verb to be. And it is the auxiliary verbs that take the um, tense then, but we'll talk about that in a second. Modals simply change the mode. They change the sort of feel of a verb. Um, modals are things like, you know, woulda, coulda, shoulda, or may, might, must, shall, all those sorts of things. So shall is a, you know, let's take shall for example. Will is what we use to technically put something into the future tense. Shall suggests a command, you know, I will go to the store, you shall go to the store, suggests that you will and you must in a sense. It's, so it's, it's more of a modal than it is a auxiliary. Um, the auxiliaries are really do, have, will, or be. Now, let's look at these a little bit more closely. Do is what we sometimes call a dummy auxiliary because it is really more of a placeholder and it doesn't actually signify anything. Of course, there is the verb to do, and that's separate. But when we're talking about the auxiliary verb do, it doesn't really mean anything. You'll notice that we use it to turn regular sentences into questions. Um, you know, she does it. How does she do it? You know, we add the do form there. You finish the homework versus did you finish the homework? Um, we also use it when we want to use not between the subject and predicate. So I do not care versus I not care or I care not. Um, I care not's fine. 
I do not care is fine. I not care, not fine. <laughs> okay. Have is another auxiliary verb. As I said, we use it to create the, um, we use it with the past participle to create the perfect tense. And again, notice that it is the auxiliary verb have, like the dummy auxiliary do, that takes the present or past tense that is uh, tensed. To be is used with the present participle to create the progressive tense. And notice, of course, that the progressive tense can be, uh, excuse me, the progressive um, participle can then be tense, past or present, based on what tense the to be verb is. And with the auxiliary will, it can be future tense as well. So this is, you're going to miss me when I'm gone. The committee had been discussing the proposal when the director walked in and so forth. And then finally, will. While um, it is necessary to use it for the quote unquote future tense, it's not exactly accurate to say that we use will for the future tense because most of the time we actually use the present progressive. We don't say, I will go to the store. You say, I am going to the store. Something like, I'm in the process, it's about to happen. I guess it depends on the immediacy of the future tense, it depends on whether we use will or whether we use the present progressive. And of course, that can also be used in conjunction with the perfect um, uh, or present progressive tenses as well. I will have been going to school for 20 years by the time I graduate from medical school. So this is a handy verb chart to kind of walk you through all the different ways in which we tense verbs. Basically, what we have here are 12 different time frames for situating our verbs, whether it's the simple past, present, or future, whether it's the progressive past, present, or future, the perfect past, present, or future, or finally the perfect progressive past, present, or future. Okay, hopefully, I guess I'm hoping that most of that's pretty intuitive. And it's the type of thing that's pretty easy to look up. You just have to really know that the auxiliary verbs um, take the tenses and that, um, so that you recognize when a verb is using an auxiliary or a modal or not. But otherwise, I think it's pretty straightforward. What I really wanna talk about is the passive voice because it is not straightforward. <laughs> so here's a few things right off the bat to know about the passive voice. Um, number one, all sentence patterns, except pattern number two with to be and adjectivals, they're always in the active voice, always. <laughs> always. Now you can turn some of them into the passive voice, but only pattern number two is an option for the passive voice. And I'll explain why. Next thing to know, sentences that could be written in the passive voice have to have a direct object. So if you want to turn something in the active voice into the passive, you have to have a sentence with a direct object or it does not work. Finally, it will be helpful to add some extra terms to describe the subject, the verb, and the direct object so that we can understand the distinction between active and passive. I'm gonna use the term agent to describe the thing that does the action. I'm gonna connect that to the subject in the active voice. I'm gonna use the word action, which we um, will connect with the verb to describe the thing that the agent is doing. And I'll use recipient to connect with the direct object, that thing or person that receives the action from the agent. Luckily, we often think of subject and verb and direct object in these ways, um, but it will be helpful to just kind of keep these terms on hand as well. So in this case, we have the girl through the ball, right? The subject is the girl, the verb or action is through, and the direct object is the ball. Pretty straightforward, the girl through the ball. Now the passive voice, kind of reverses this to a degree. It reverses the recipient with the agent. Well, I shouldn't say it reverses. It replaces the agent with the recipient so that the recipient now becomes our grammatical subject. You see why I wanted to use that term recipient? Because it is no longer the direct object. It is the grammatical subject, but it is the wow. receiver of the action. All right, so that's one change. The next change is that the verb um, or action gets changed into to be plus the past participle of that original verb or action, okay? So through becomes, because it's irregular, 
was thrown, all right? Was is the to be form, uh, the past tense, and then thrown is the past participle. The agent, remember he was our original subject, or she in this case, um, she is no longer the subject, but nor is she the direct object. Because remember, this is now a sentence that does not have a direct object. It used to, but now it does not. Now it's a pattern to sec, uh, sentence, one that has uh, the to be verb. So the agent now becomes the object of an optional adverbial prepositional phrase. And I emphasize optional because you don't necessarily have to have it. But that prepositional phrase will always use the preposition by. Okay, um, it will always be optional, will always be adverbial, and it will always use the preposition by. And the agent will be the object of that prepositional phrase. Okay, so the active voice, the girl threw the ball, becomes the ball was thrown by the girl. Here's a visual graph of what I'm talking about. So notice how in the active voice, the subject, verb, and object line up with ag agent, action, and recipient. In the passive voice, the recipient, which used to be our object, now becomes a grammatical subject. The verb um, is now changed into the to be verb, and we take the past participle of the action, and we add that to the to be verb. And then finally, we don't have an object, but we do have an optional prepositional phrase, one that uses by and one that takes as its object what was the subject in the active voice. So students hate grammar is the active voice. Students is the subject, hates is the verb, or students hate, and then grammar is the object. In the passive voice, grammar is hated by students, all right? Clear enough? So normally when we are trying to deal with a passive voice, we just use it without even thinking. So it's not often that we actually have to construct the passive voice and turn an active voice sentence into the passive voice. Instead, I want us to focus on how we identify the passive voice because we want to be able to find it in our writing or other people's writing. Now, there are reasons to use the passive voice. We are going to talk about that in class. I'm not gonna cover that in this lecture. But for right now, I just want us to figure out how we find it, and then we can decide what we want to do with it. So here are the things to think about when you're trying to identify the passive voice. I'll give you kind of three rules again. Number one, the passive voice is always a pattern to sentence, okay? Always, always, always. A pattern to sentence that has a to be verb and it has a subject complement. That's what hated is here. It's a subject complement. That's what th uh, thrown is. Um, it's a subject complement. It doesn't really seem like one. Um, well, it's probably best not to call it a subject complement, but it's the same form. Okay, it's the same form. All right. Sorry about that. Um, let's go to number two. This is why it's not really a subject complement. The, sub, um, the, the subject complement is always the past participle of a transitive verb. I guess the reason I don't want to call it a subject complement is because, um, well, you'll see why in a second. But just know that it's always the past participle of a transitive verb. All right. Has to be a transitive verb. Has to be a past participle. I mean, let's think of an intransitive verb. Um, remains, okay? We could not say the ball remains and turn it into the passive voice. Why not? Because there's no direct object to put into the subject positions. We, it would just be left with is remained by the ball. That doesn't make any sense, right? So intransitive verbs cannot be made into the passive voice. You need that object to become the subject of your sentence. Finally, the passive voice always does, or at least it always could, have a bi-prepositional phrase, as I said. It's optional. It doesn't have to be there, but it could be there. Some people like to say you can identify the passive voice by, you know, if you can throw in the phrase by zombies, then you know it's the passive voice. Sure, that's kind of good enough, but I want you to understand exactly why um, or what technically um, we mean when we say that the um, adverbial is optional. So this is why I was hesitant to say that the um,
past participle in the passive voice is a subject complement because it can get us a little confused because the subject complement that is an adjectival can look an awful lot like the passive voice, but it doesn't mean that it is. Um, we often use the past participle form to turn verbs into objects, and that can make it difficult to help us distinguish between a uh, subject complement adjectival and the passive voice. And the key is that optional bipropositional phrase. If that bipropositional phrase could be used, then it is in the passive voice. If it cannot, if it does not fit, or if it's not implied, then it's not the passive voice, it's just a pattern two sentence. So let me give you an example. I am satisfied. That is an active voice sentence. It is a pattern two sentence. Am is the uh, to be verb. Satisfied is a subject complement. It's an adjectival. It is defining uh, I, the subject. I am satisfied with your performance. That is also an active voice sentence. Same type of thing. I is the subject, to be is the verb, satisfied is the adjectival subject complement. With your performance is an optional adverbial, but it's not a bi-optional adverbial, it's just an optional adverbial. But if I said, I am satisfied by your performance, then I have created the passive voice and satisfied is no longer an adjective, it is the past participle of the transitive verb satisfy. We could write this in the active voice, your performance satisfied me, okay? Um, so if I can change the adverbial to have a bi-prepositional phrase and the verb is the past participle of a transitive verb, then it is in the passive voice. So no passive voice possible for intransitive verbs, you know, like smile. Again, try to put smile, um, she smiles into the passive voice. Can't be done. You used to say is smiled by her, but there's no subject. And that's because it needs a transitive verb. So I've made this little graph here to kind of um, explain what I mean. If you think of all the pattern two sentences that are adjectivals, the passive voice is part of them, but it's not all of them. You can have adjectival subject complements without it being the passive voice. All right, let's just look at a few examples. Um, I'm gonna run through the even numbers um, as before, and hopefully that will help us kind of see what we mean. We'll talk about this and work on it more in class. Um, this exercise wants you to do different things according to the different sections. The first one says, change the following active voices into the passive voice. Um, remember that the object of the active voice functions as a subject in the passive voice. So we know that we have the active voice. We want to make it passive. Wilhelm Conrad Rottingen accidentally discovered the x-ray. Well, discovered is my transitive verb. The x-ray is my object. So I'll just switch it around. The x-ray was discovered by Wilhelm Rottingen. Pretty straightforward. Even something longer can still become the passive voice. Hedy Lamar, an Austrian actress who had immigrated to the United States, and you can perhaps hear my dog there, or crates right next to my desk. And George Antheil developed a secret communication system during World War II. Hopefully we can get through this. Um, what's my verb developed? What's my object? A secret communication system. So I'll just switch that around. A secret communication system was developed during World War II, I can keep my optional adverb, that's fine, by Hedy Lamarr, an Austrian actress who had immigrated to the United States, and George Antheil, okay? I guess I haven't turned on my um, scribbler, but hopefully you can figure it out from there. Let me pause for a second, see if I can deal with her. All right, let's see if we can wrap this up. Um, let's look at the second set, B change the following passive voices into the active voice. And remember that the subject of the passive voice is an object in the active. Now we didn't really talk about this, but they're gonna note here that if the agent is missing, you will have to supply one to act as a subject for the sentences in the active voice. Because we had to focus on going from the active to the passive, we didn't talk about the fact that if you wanna go from the passive to the active, you may not have a natural agent to serve as your subject, in which case you're gonna to have to figure out what that should be or come up with one. So Charles Babbage is considered a pioneer of computer science. 
Oh, right. Okay. I was confused for a second. Um, so we have to figure out who considers Charles Babbage to be a pioneer of computer science. Um, we are missing that by prepositional phrase and it's optional, so it doesn't have to be there. So we would say, let's say um, present day historians. Present day historians consider Charles Babbage a pioneer of computer science or to be a pioneer of computer science. Technically what we have here is an object complement. Um, if we change it to the active voice, it would become an object complement. So don't want to deal with that. So we're just going to keep moving. But that's kind of how we change that to the active voice. Scholars today consider Charles Babbage to be a pioneer of computer science. Um, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Francis Crick and James Watson for producing the double helix model. Now, if we want to make that active, we have to figure out, okay, who is awarding them? Award was awarded is going to become awards or award. Um, we just have to figure out who our subject is. Uh, let's just say the, what is it called? The Stockholm Committee? I can't remember. The committee, we'll just say the committee. The committee awarded the Nobel Prize and then just the rest of the sentence. To Francis Crick and James Watson for producing the double helix model. All, is that, all of that are optional adverbial prepositional phrases. Um, so all we need to do is move the subject into the object position. Turn was awarded into the active voice and the um, past tense simple awarded and then figure out who we want to be the um, agent and subject, the committee. The committee awarded the Nobel Prize and then that's it. All right, let's look at C. Now with C, they are telling you that you have to decide whether it's active or passive and then you have to um, flip it to the other way. Uh, two and four over on this side. Mary Anderson was given a patient for windshield patent, excuse me, <laughs> that makes a lot more sense, was given a patent for windshield wipers in 1903. So I want to look at this verb first off. It is a to be verb and we have the past participle given. The question is, is this an adjectival given or is this um, a transitive verb given? And it is a transitive verb given. Give is a verb that requires an object. You cannot simply say, um, Mary Anderson was, or excuse me, Mary Anderson gave, gave what, right? If we use the verb to give, we always require a complement. So we can now uh, flip the subject into the direct object position. And then we have to figure out who gave this to her. We don't have a prepositional phrase anywhere, or excuse me, a bi-prepositional phrase. So we're going to have to invent that subject. We're going to have to figure out who the agent is and make them our grammatical subject. I will say the United States government, they issue patents, or the patent office, even better. The patent office gave Mary Anderson a patent for windshield wipers in 1903. Um, and then we are, is that right? Yes, except I should clarify, Mary Anderson becomes the indirect object what is given is the patent. So the patent office gives Mary Anderson a patent for her windshield wipers. And so she is the indirect object. Put I over here, and this becomes the direct object. So hold on one second. Okay, so what I should clarify, um, when I was trying to kind of keep it simple, I was focusing primarily on direct objects and said that the direct object becomes the subject and the subject becomes the direct object. Indirect objects can also work there. Now, we could do it a different way, right? We could make, let's, let's say we have that active sentence, okay? The patent office gave Mary Anderson a patent for windshield wipers in 1903. Could we make that sentence passive with the direct object, a patent as a subject? Absolutely, we could say, a patent was given to Mary Anderson for windshield wipers in 1903 by the patent office. Okay, so 
The indirect object can become the subject. So can the, or, uh, the direct object usually becomes a subject, but the indirect object can as well. Um, it does require just a little finessing. Anyways, I don't know if it's that important to focus on. It doesn't come up that often, but technically that's what we're working with. Finally, Jameson A. Smith is remembered as the inventor of basketball. Is is the to be verb. Remembered is a verb that could be transitive or intransitive, um, but normally it's transitive. And so um, you use, usually you remember something. And as the inventor of basketball, that's an optional adverbial. So we have to figure out, okay, who's remembering him? We don't have a bi-prepositional phrase, so we need an agent and make that agent the subject. We will say NBA players. NBA players remember James Naismith as the inventor of basketball. All right? So take some time to do the other uh, odd number exercises. Check your work if you'd like, and then we'll practice some more in class.